can hear me? Yeah. Uh, ciao, mi chiamo Gil Barros. Uh, io non parlo italiano. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, uh, una altra birra, per favore. <laughs> <laughs> the, the important things to say, right? <laughs> so I am in the cloud business unit. I'm a partner product manager, and that means I work with uh, partners, customers. Uh, we call it herding cats. I, I help uh, integrations come together, and uh, in particular, operators have, have been my latest focus. So you've heard a lot about operators in the last uh, few hours, um, sort of a high level. Uh, I'm going to dig a little deeper into operators today and uh, tell you why you should care, um, why it's important and what you can get out of them. We're also going to talk about best practices and really what we've learned in the past uh, two years, roughly, that we've been doing operators. Um, and uh, what we've sort of created to, to help you get there. So we're really gaining momentum. Uh, a lot of open source projects are using operators as the de facto way of deploying on uh, Kubernetes and on OpenShift. Um, nowadays, uh, if you look on Operator Hub, you can see a, a lot of the projects that you use are already there. And uh, there's a quite a significant backlog that uh, the team I'm on is, is working on, on getting new operators for, for new open source products added to Operator Hub. Um, but what we're seeing also is that ISVs are really looking also at operators as for their commercial products, for their enterprise distributions, as a, the way to deploy on OpenShift. So I'm going to assume that you have some experience with operators. Uh, you've been here for a couple of hours. That's sufficient experience. We'll, we'll dig into that a little more. Um, and we're assuming, of course, you have some experience with Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, so let's add to that. Operators are procedural best practices. They take what's in the minds of uh, your admins, your developers, on how to lifecycle your application, how to do everything from day one, deploy the application, install it, to fun stuff uh, like metrics, like health checks, um, like uh, auto-tuning. Um, day one is fairly well understood, right? There, everybody has a script to install their app. Everybody has an installation tool. That's easy. Day two is difficult, right? How do you make sure that you can scale when scaling time, <laughs> when scaling time happens? Um, how do you detect that you need to scale? How do you detect that there's something wrong with the health of your app um, and act on that without having to rely on uh, the one admin, the one, uh, the one person who deployed it, who remembers how, oh, you have to do it like this, otherwise this breaks. Um, so the idea is you have uh, your subject matter experts create the logic for how to do these things and put them in the operator. Um, very quickly on how it works, there's a custom resource, uh, which is effectively a Kubernetes controller. Um, Kubernetes is watching uh, the, the custom resource and the configuration and basically looping on making sure that the uh, operator and the app are in the situation that you want them to be, right? Making sure there's enough, enough uh, resources, making sure that you know, everything is where it's supposed to be. But more importantly, why, why should you care? Um, and I mentioned that it's automating things that are in people's heads um, that you don't want to get that pager in the middle of you know, Saturday night. So make it so that we can, we can do this. And, and the day two stuff that I mentioned is the complicated stuff, right? Um, resizing isn't just scaling. Resizing is I have to add stuff to load balancers. 
I have to talk about quorum, I have to decide where to scale something to, is it gonna be in this data center, is it on this server, is it over there, does it have to be in Asia Pacific, does it have to be in the US? So there's a lot more to resize than just add one more instance, and you can do that with operators. Um, same thing for upgrades, right? Up upgrades tend to be complicated, you tend to worry about them, but if you codify all of that in your operator, it simplifies it, and I'll talk in more detail about that as we go. Reconfiguring or configuring uh, your app, a lot of times there are 500,000 possible tunables, configuration options, but you know you really only want your app or your users to change five of those. Right? You don't want them to change every other little thing that's going to break something else. You only want them to change a few of those settings. So you can make it so that your operator configuration options only include the ones that you want your users to change. Um, backups. Backups sound simple until you start talking about backing up databases or stateful data. Um, so you can prepare your environment for backup with, with your operator. Um, and we talked already about healing and, and what that means and you know, detecting that something is not in the right state and defining what the right states are. Um, but it's, it's, it's more complex than someone looking at the dashboard and saying, oh, this is orange, now what do I do? Well, you can make your operator know what a bad state is, know to set it orange, and then know how to fix that. Is it, are you running out of resources? Do you need to move workloads around? Things like that. But uh, le let's get into a little bit more of wh what makes a good operator, right? What are the best practices? Um, those are scenarios or, or situations in which an operator would be useful, but let's, wh where can we, what are things that we have to do to make this better? So this is not as bad of an eye chart as Brian's uh, initial one, um, but uh, let's talk about uh, some of these. So this is for the development side. Do I have a pointer? I do, excellent. I'll try not to blind anybody. Um, so this is for the development side of your operator, right? So the, if there's one thing that you should leave with here today is Operators should do one thing and do it well. Don't create an operator that deploys your entire stack. Create an operator that does that one part of the app, you know, deploys your app and has dependencies, right? So your operator could say, for me to deploy this web front end, I need a database. I need, you know, these three other things. But have OLM, the Operator Lifecycle Manager, handle those dependencies because you don't want to own the operator for all of these other apps, all of these other open source projects, which aren't your responsibility, right? Those, those should be handled by the subject matter expert of those uh, operators, which I think is the first two bullets there. Um, use, use an SDK. Uh, the operator SDK already creates all of the scaffolding, like all of the Reusable, reusable code that's necessary to make an operator work is already provided for you. So use an, S an SDK. Um, in the end, I'm gonna have some links to uh, a lot of the documentation on this, but more importantly, also a link to the learn.openshift.org page, which walks you through creating an operator. It's, it's how I learned to do operators a year ago. It's you, you just click the learn button and it pops up um, an environment for you, and it pops up the step-by-step, -step, this is how you create an operator. Um, and of course, it uses the operator SDK, <laughs> which we'll talk about a little more. Uh, don't hard code things, don't hard code namespaces. You'd be surprised how often this happens. Um, and there's a collision out there waiting to happen. Uh, not all of your environments are gonna look the same. Um, and I think lastly on this one, uh, APIs, have a tendency of sticking around for way longer than we expect. So version them properly. <laughs> have, have different versions for your operators. Make sure that 
they make sense. And there's uh, there are Kubernetes guidelines and just Simfer guidelines for for how to do that. So running running operators on clusters, um, the the. The scaffolding, the framework is already set up so that you don't need to run your operator as root. And I know you're thinking, oh no, my my specific scenario requires my operator to run as root. It, it probably doesn't. <laughs> Talk to us about that. We're we're happy to help. There's there's a whole team of us that um, help people with their operators, help them develop their operators, help them troubleshoot their operators. Um, and uh, we've created this framework so that things that usually would need to be run as root are handled by the framework so your operator itself doesn't have to, right? Uh, you don't need to handle all those privileges that uh, could cause issues in the future. So things like CRDs get registered by OLM, so you don't need to do it yourself, so you don't need the privileges for that. Um, writing meaningful status information is, Surprisingly, a, a problem that we bump into fairly often. So, the one of the groups I'm in um, validates and tests and provides feedback on operators that show up uh, in our uh, GitHub repository for Operator Hub. So, I look at a lot of operators um, during the day and I review them and test them. And one of the big things when I'm testing an operator is I don't know that much about your app. I read the description. I read a paragraph about your app, and I'm trying to deploy your operator. And the first thing that I look for when it doesn't look like this installed right, it doesn't look like this operator is working, is what are the what are the stat what's the status codes that I'm seeing? Like, what are the status messages? Is it telling me that it broke? Is it telling me anything useful about how it broke? And think of think of me as a user, right? Like, I'm a, I'm a good example of a person in your organization or a person out on the web who is interested in deploying your app, is interested in using your operator, but doesn't know as much as you do about it. So tell me as much as possible in those error messages, in those status codes. And there's proper places to put them in the, in the custom resource object, et cetera. Um, we'll talk about updating, um, but uh, the key thing this, this is not the company line, this is my line. The key thing for operators for me is one operator, one app version. So don't have an operator version deploy eight different versions of your app. I'll talk about that more later. Um, but more importantly, uh, an operator version should be able to understand how the N minus one version of that operator works and update that. So. Um, when you in, you know when you develop version uh, you know 1.1 of your operator, it gets installed on the system. It's going to be working with an existing version of your app, and it needs to be able to update that. So that's the one thing that you should focus on is that logic needs to go from n minus one to n. Don't think of n minus two, n minus three, n minus four because we're just going to do it incrementally. Um, don't deploy other operators. I talked about dependencies already. Um, use uh, the operator lifecycle manager is going to handle dependencies for you. So easy. Um, ah, uh, okay. So should always be able to deploy and come up without user input. So that's another uh, piece of feedback uh, that I have from installing, you know, a dozen or hundreds of operators over the last year is. I don't always know what all the possible tunables are. I don't know what the required configuration options are. So when I install an operator, it should, when I subscribe to an operator, it should install the most bas basic version of the app with the most commonly used configuration settings. So the app should come up. At that point, I should go in there and configure it, and the operator will then configure the app. But <laughs> it's better for when you deploy an operator to your cluster for it to come up with a version of the app, then for it to immediately error out and say, you didn't configure, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 just have it install like a basic, you know, uh, this app can't talk to anybody, but it's up and it, and it works. Because then you give that feedback to the user that, oh, okay, everything is good, it's working, I just now need to go and configure it. All right, 
So how do we do this? Um, hopefully you memorize the previous two slides. There is a quiz at the end, a test, um, and that will define how many beers you get at the end of the day, is how well you score on the Twitter. Uh, so we'll get there. <laughs> so the operator framework, uh, so we've, we're aware that there's a lot of best practices, that there's a lot of um, things that we're telling you, you should do it like this, you should do it like that, you shouldn't do this. So we've tried to um, sort of codify all of this into a framework, right? Like the operator mentality is like, put the logic in something so that you don't have to repeat it. Um, and we've created some tooling. So uh, three big parts of this is the operator SDK, which I mentioned before. Um, it basically creates all that framework for the operator so that when you're writing your operator, you're really just having to focus on writing the logic necessary to get that op, you know, to get that app deployed, right? You're not worried about the controller stuff, you're not worried about the resource, you know, like you're, we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, the operator lifecycle manager is what's running on the cluster, which handles the, the, op the catalog, it handles providing access to the operators to the users, um, and also, uh, it's, it's, it's what's taking care of the life cycle of the operator, right? Um, we've talked about metering a good bit already, so I'm not going to go into that, but, you know, as, as you expect, uh, metering works for operators as well on a per namespace basis, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we're going to go through a couple of, uh, sort of a step-by-step -step scenario on how this works. Um, I usually call this person uh, Jane, but uh, I think Julia would be better. Uh, okay, so Julia, the developer, um, uses the operator SDK to create a new operator for her app. Um, you know, the operator SDK does all the scaffolding and she adds the custom logic, right? She adds the, how do I actually deploy this app? And now she has an operator, easy enough. She gets to focus on the custom logic. Taking a step back, so we've sort of uh, come up with a sort of a five phase you know, like what are the, the depth of the operator that you've, that you've created, right? So phase one and two, of course, are the, are the most common, basic install, right? You can, you can install your app um, and you can up, upgrade it from, you know, version one to version two or whatever. And you'll see that there's three different options for how you're going to uh, write your operator. Helm charts, of course, um, a lot of you already have them, um, but they're somewhat limited in that they can really only handle um, install and upgrades. The, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more detail on those, uh, but the cool stuff is over at the end over here, right? So we can handle um, scaling, uh, auto-tuning, uh, detection of issues, uh, scheduling, you know, like all of the more complex stuff is also doable over here, but you need to use either Ansible or Golang or something like that. Um, the cool thing about doing this with Helm is if you already have the Helm charts, the SDK can basically just take those and run with it. Um, it's it's very little, very low barrier to entry. Of course, you're, it's a good start, but you're limiting yourself a little bit on on how much functionality you get. Um, if you use Ansible, uh, it's it's fairly similar. Uh, you need to be able to use the Ansible um, Kubernetes modules, uh, but otherwise, it's just Ansible, which you already know, and the uh, operator SDK can take. Uh, your Ansible playbooks and, and run with them with some adjustment. But if you really want the full breadth of uh, what you can do um, with operators, uh, write it and go, and uh, you'll, go from, you'll go from there. Wow, that was terrible. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so three options on how you can get your, app, your operator written. Um, Okay, so I believe this was Joe before is when I do when I do this in the US. So uh Joe will be Marco. Okay. So M Marco? Do I roll the R? Marco? Okay. Um <laughs> so Marco will take uh Julia's uh operator. He's gonna add some metadata um and package it up and then add the operator into the lifecycle manager, right? So the metadata is just things like what kinds of permissions um, our user is going to have, um, which kinds of users have different permissions, you know, the, the RBAC stuff. Um, 
And once it's in the lifecycle manager, the user, who we'll name later, um, can then see that operator. You know, look at the packages, things like that. And this is, I think, what, what I, I mentioned this before, right? So operators are really first-class citizens, um, which means they can do things via OLM that require escalated privileges without having those privileges. Um, and it, OLM really sort of manages these, these operator components for you, so you don't have to worry about doing a lot of that lifecycle stuff. You don't have to worry about pre-registering CRDs. You don't have to worry about um, setting the actual role bindings. You don't have to worry, worry about setting uh, role-based access control or namespaces or any of that. So operator lifecycle manager really sort of helps set the system up and get things going. But uh, talking about OLM and the lifecycle, so the way this works is we, you subscribe to the operator, right? So the user is subscribing to the operator that you know, was in the catalog, right? Uh, Marco put the operator in the, in the OLM catalog. Then the user, uh, what did I call the user? Luca, Luca is the user. Um, Luca subscribes to the operator on his system and the operator gets, you know, sort of life cycles and versioned as, as it goes, right? So whenever a new version of the operator gets put in the, in the lifecycle manager, uh, the cluster updates it, OLM updates it on the system. So if we take this a step further, um, I, I lost an app off the end of the screen. If we take this a step further, we're talking about you know, operator version 1.12 uh, being you know, deploying your app version 3, and 1.13 deploying your app version 3.1, and etc. So this operator knows how to update from this one to this one. Easy, right? which means this operator knows how to update this version of the app, wait, this version of the app to this version of the app. And not necessarily previous versions, it doesn't have to do that because that's too complex. Why, you know, why make your life difficult? Oh, why make your life difficult? Um, of course, you can, we'll let you do that. You know, I, I may get, annoyed when I see that in the, the operator when I'm reviewing it, but yeah, okay, they wanted to do that, go ahead. <laughs> and how you would do this is basically just set the configuration option in, in, your, in your resource and say, deploy uh, this version. And then if you want to update it, you would just change the resource to, okay, deploy the next version and handle the updates. This seems complex to me. It's not, you're welcome to do it, but do that instead. It's so much easier for you to keep track of your app versions by your operator versions. You know, both will be supported. We're happy with you. But, uh, but remember, um, n minus one to n keeps life easy. All right. You've seen this slide before. William stole it from me. Um, so dependencies, right? So we've talked about having your operator do one thing, keep it simple, do one thing well. Um, and that means your operator is just gonna say, I require Jaeger, or I require CockroachDB, and OLM is going to then go and install those for you. So don't write your own version of the operator for Jaeger. They, there's already a Jaeger operator, use it. The Lifecycle Manager will take care of that for you. Uh, here we go. Um, Julia, Marco, and Luca. All right. So the operators made it to here, and now Luca says, oh, okay, I want that app. So let's subscribe to that operator channel. You know, I'm going to say which namespace I want it to be deployed on. And then suddenly there's an operator instance, and the operator creates a managed application. Easy enough. Um, note that... Uh, Marco sets the, the privileges. So Luca is only going to see or have access to install the operators that um, he's able to, like he's, he has the privileges to. So when we look at, um, when Luca looks at the operator hub in his um, OpenShift console, he's going to see, you know, certain operators uh, in his catalog 
and which ones he can install. He just goes and clicks install in this namespace, and he's good to go. So that was my 10,000 foot view of operators, what they do, why you care. Um, there are some links on how to get started. I don't have a learn.openshift.com link here, I'm sorry. Uh, but you saw that in some of the other talks. But uh, yeah, go take a look at operators. Go try them out. Uh, it's very easy to try them out. Uh, if you go to try.openshift.org, it'll deploy a cluster for you, and then you can go into the console and into the operator hub in the console and just click through and install an operator. Try it. Um, and play with creating operators on learn.openshift.org. It makes it really easy. It was the first time I've used that sort of interactive uh, learning system. It's all in the web browser. You don't need your own cluster or anything. It all happens in your, in your browser. Excellent. Thank you.